Hello and welcome to Talking Law, the podcast where you can hear barristers, judges, solicitors, managing partners and more talk about their lives and careers in law. I'm Sally Penny MBE. I'm a barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester and I'm the founder of Women in the Law UK. Before you meet today's guest, a reminder that the Women in the Law UK annual dinner and conference will be taking place in November 2022. Please visit womeninthelawuk.com for more details. I'd also love you to watch my recent TED Talk. Please head to ted.com and search for Sally Penny. Today I'm talking law with the president of Magdalen College, Oxford, Dinah Rose QC also of Blackstone's Chambers. Over the past 30 years, Dinah has appeared in many of the leading cases in the field of public law, human rights, employment law, competition law, and is ranked as a star individual in the current edition of Chambers and Partners for multiple areas of law. I began by asking Dinah what led her into law. I have lots of answers to this, and I'm never sure which is the truth. Um, it's <laughs> Tell me all of them. It certainly is true that when I was a small child, I quite early on developed a burning sense of injustice and fairness and the importance of fairness. Yes. I remember an episode when I was at primary school, and I think I was about six years old, and a teacher sent me on an errand to find another teacher, and I couldn't find them. Mm-hmm. And while I was looking, I opened a door where another teacher was teaching a music lesson. And this teacher complained about me and said I'd burst into her lesson, which was completely untrue. And I got told off without ever being asked for my side of what had happened. Mm. And I remember throwing the most absolutely extreme tantrum because the outrageousness of the fact that nobody had asked me from my side or from my defense. Yes. At age six struck me as completely outrageous. Yes. And and I think that was quite a lot of it. Mm. I also love arguing and I love the idea that you could be paid to do that as a profession. Yes. Yes. Well, when you've done it so, so well. But I mean, would I be right in calling you a human rights lawyer? Because you're set. Um, and I think you're still a dual tenant there. Um, I, I'm still very much a tenant. A tenant there. Um, will, will you class yourself as a human rights lawyer, as I was sort of thinking about the cases you've been involved in? Well, amongst other things, yes. I've done a lot of human rights cases. I've done a lot of public law cases. Mm. I've also done a lot of employment cases. Yeah. And in more recent years, probably the most important part of my practice was competition law. All of your achievements were well whilst having three children. Two children. Two children, right? I don't know why I always thought you had three children. I know you've got a dog, so maybe uh, (laughs) he's counting as the third. (laughs) How did you manage? So I had my first child in 1997. And I remember when I was pregnant, I was doing an an employment tribunal case against a QC. I was a junior barrister at the time. I had a case. It was actually about women in combat against a very senior silk. I won't name. And um, we had a preliminary hearing and I was about 12 weeks pregnant. And the court wanted to list the trial for a date when I'd be 36 weeks pregnant. Uh. And I remember my my opponent saying, you can't do that. And and me saying, why why ever not? You know, being sort of actually amazed that he would think I couldn't do it. And I I did. And I did do that hearing. And I remember cross-examining these uh, enormous burly uh, Royal Marine commandos while I was 36 <laughs> weeks pregnant. Um, and a lot of people used to say to me, well, you know, you're working very hard now. You'll feel very differently after the baby's born. Mm. And after the baby was born, I felt exactly the same way. Mm. I didn't feel any different. I still yeah. wanted to work. I still wanted to be at the bar. Yeah. Um, I took some time off, about five months. Mm. And then I had a full-time nanny. And with my second baby... I took only, I think, about six or seven weeks maternity leave. Wow. Because I already had my nanny in place. Yeah. Um, for it. Who, you know, who I trusted and who lived 
um, next door to us. Yeah. So it was easy to go back to work. And the honest truth is I wanted to go back to work. Yeah. And, you know, I, I recognize that there are lots of people who don't feel that way. Yeah. But it is the way I felt. And then when the children were five and eight, we moved house. And our wonderful nanny, who'd been with us for eight years, uh, couldn't move with us because she wanted to live in a different part of town. And so she left and we were interviewing nannies. And my husband said, you know, I could do this job. And he gave up work. And he was a house, he was a house husband for a number of years until the children had finished school. In truth, could you both be at work, do you think? Well, we were for... Well, the children were really small. Yeah. Uh, he, he was a TV producer mm. and I was a barrister. And yeah. there were times when it was really difficult. Yes, it's a big job. Yeah, and if you both have a crisis on, it, it is very difficult. Yes. And very stressful. Mm. We were very, very lucky in that we did have an extremely good nanny, Rachel Herford, um, oh. who was our only nanny ever and is still a wonderful person. And my parents live in London, so they were around. You know, we, we were very lucky. We, I had enough money to pay for good childcare mm. and I had a supportive family. I can't really claim to have struggled. No, and uh, I have to say, I don't know if you remember this, the Association of Women Barristers held an event in Gray's Inn mm-hmm. and, uh, and yes, you spoke on the panel yeah. um, and uh, it, it wasn't all positive, not you, some of the other mm-hmm. panel members. And lots of women came up to you and you were very honest and frank about your career and how you, you manage it. And I certainly were one of the people who found it helpful. But I'd like to go back to your career, if I may. I-, I want to ask you about if you've got a memorable case. Now, a friend of mine who's absolutely nothing to do with um, the law, Stacey Copeland, she's a teacher and has set up a charity called Pave the Way, was a professional footballer and then subsequently a professional boxer. So you mean a lot to her. In fact, she's got a T-shirt, which I've forgotten to bring. <laughs> in a memorable case to her. So she's just a lay person. But maybe we can start by you telling us about that case and why it made history and why people go around wearing the T-shirts with your name on it. The reason is, <laughs> it's about Jane Couch. Yes. Jane Couch, the Fleetwood assassin. Uh, Jane, who is a, a really wonderful person and a fighter in every sense. Mm. Um, so she came from a very deprived background and she became a boxer. She was a very talented boxer. Yes. And she uh, fought successfully in the United States Mm. and she wanted to fight professionally in the UK. And the British Boxing Board of Control refused to give her a license to be a boxer. And their reason was quite blatantly because she was a woman. And they came up with two reasons for this. One was that professional boxers were supposed to fight stripped to the waist. you know, you could do something about that. Yes. And the second was, and I swear this is true, women are emotionally unstable because they menstruate. Ugh. That was their their case. So um, I remember this case came to me, in fact, just after I'd come back from maternity leave. Oh, right. And I remember seeing it and just thinking, good God, this is an amazing case. It's amazing. So we brought a case to an employment tribunal for sex discrimination mm. and for unlawful restraint of trade. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yes, not, not something that often happens. No. And it was the most extraordinary hearing. It was quite unbelievable. The media, of course, were fascinated. Yes. Um, because at that time, it was still very controversial, the idea that women might be boxers. Really? I mean, we, we think, you know, after the London Olympics, it was tremendously affirmative and people were really keen on women boxers. Yes, yeah. But in the 1990s, a lot of people were very hostile and they would write uh, articles saying things like, it's disgusting to see women fighting, it's prurient, what will you do if women are injured, it's revolting. You know, people were quite viscerally disgusted by the idea of women as boxers. So at the hearing, the British Boxing Board called a doctor to give evidence. Uh, that women were emotionally unstable oh because, they, because they miss it. So I said to him, so um, presumably on your evidence, you wouldn't want women to do lots of responsible and difficult jobs like, you know, airline pilot or yeah. a barrister or anything well, like that. And he, judge. Said, and he said, yes, he said, yes, absolutely. And I said, well, also, presumably on your evidence, it'd be a very bad idea to leave a woman alone in charge of small children. 
And and there was just kind of laughter in court. You know, the, the kind of ludicrousness of this case they were running was was kind of uh, bizarre. So obviously we won. Rightly, yeah. Uh, but she she still had a really difficult time, and it was really too late for her to make a career. I think out of it. Yeah. But that really paved the way, didn't it? For women in boxing. For women in boxing. I want to ask you, actually, instead of me listing all these cases, if you got a memorable um, case that really means a lot to you, I mean, I have a favourite case of yours, which is the one about fees for employment cases. The Um, Unison case. The Unison case in the Supreme Court. And because that's fundamental for me, probably uh, as an employment practitioner, to access to justice. Yeah. So I don't want to list all my favourite cases, <laughs> but I wondered just for you whether you had a case that was either a favourite or a first case or memorable for whatever reason that perhaps you could share with us. Well, I'm, the Unison case definitely would be right up there as, mm. as one of my favourites yeah. uh, because of its enormous significance for so many people. It's it, One of the most satisfying things you can do as a barrister is to be involved in a case that, has a real impact on people's lives. And that case undoubtedly did. Absolutely. It it gave people back rights that had been taken from them Mm. by the uh, Employment Tribunal fees. And for anyone who doesn't recall it, the government introduced regulations saying that you had to pay a fee of up up to £1,200 to ring claims uh, in employment tribunals. If if for a discrimination claim, it was £1,200. And the effect of this was that discrimination claims plummeted. Mm. Unfair dismissal as well, yeah. um, but discrimination in particular absolutely plummeted because people simply couldn't afford oh, yeah. to enforce their rights. And if you've just lost your job, the last thing you're going to be able to do is pay a court fee. Yes. Um, and the case had been argued below on the basis of European law. Mm. And I was asked, I was brought in in the Supreme Court and asked um, to argue the case. And I, and I said that I thought we should refocus it to focus on the common law right of access to justice, which I've always thought is a very powerful right. And also, you know, I know that it's attractive to the Supreme Court, that kind of common law basis for civil liberties. Mm. So we did, we argued it on that basis. And and the government were very angry and kept saying things like, you've completely changed the basis of your case. (laughs) And she was, yes, we have. What are you going to do about it? Because it's just a pure legal argument. They can't really make too much of a fuss. But I mean, it was quite blatant that we were arguing the case in a different way. Yes. And we had a court uh, presided over by Lord Reid. The um, current president. The current president. Um, oh, actually, it was Brenda. No, maybe Lady Hale was presiding, but he was definitely on the court. Mm. And I knew that this line of argument would appeal to him. And... So it proved. I mean, the the judgment that Lord Reed wrote in the Unison case, uh, I think, is one of the great judgments. It's it's an amazing uh, vindication of the right of access to justice. It's a fundamental common law right. And he cites all my favourite people like Blackstone. (laughs) Um, So it was he even cites Magna Carta, which I have to say, I didn't have the guts to cite. (laughs) If you find yourself citing Magna Carta to the Supreme Court, you're in a lot of trouble. I know. Um, that's what I was just thinking. But they can cite it to you. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's extraordinary because you were a frequent appearer, if that's even a word, in the Supreme Court. Oh, you know, yeah. I love, it was my favourite tribunal, undoubtedly. I loved the Supreme Court. And, and very relaxed, no robes. Yeah. Um, uh, just tell me a bit about that. Or I always say the new Supreme Court. I don't mean it like that because previously it was in the House of Lords, yeah. of course, wasn't it? Um, but as you know, these are the greatest legal minds. You can't hide behind wig and gown, so to speak. You know, bad hair day. You're just there with your legal arguments, uh, yeah. as we saw in the prorogation case. For those who perhaps don't watch regularly, why is it one of your well? if not your favourite tribunal. Definitely always was my favourite tribunal. A number of reasons. Partly, I think, the way the court was set up was really good. Yeah. They've always had lovely staff there who go out of their way to make you feel welcome and relaxed. Yes. And that makes a lot of difference. Yes. There was a striking difference between the Supreme Court and the House of Lords. The House of Lords would look at you like you're a piece of dirt on their shoe when you walked (laughs) in because you weren't a peer. But the Supreme Court was always very welcoming and friendly. So that that was one thing. Uh, It was also a very comfortable court. 
from yeah. Africa, really good facilities. Yes. I know this sounds ridiculous, but these things do make a difference. No, they do. But, but they, they do. It, it had, on a, and this is part of the culture of the court, there was a wonderful atmosphere. The judges are very bright, but they would never attack counsel. Yes. They were extremely courteous, very thoughtful, very polite. You always felt like your arguments got a proper fair hearing. Yeah. They would ask you probing and difficult questions, but they were always fair questions. And I don't think I ever came away from a hearing in the Supreme Court, whether I won or lost, yes. and thought, damn, I haven't had a fair hearing. Wow. I mean, that, that's extraordinary to say. And you're all on the same level. Yeah. Which, you know, no, no other call, perhaps in, in, well, employment driving, you're kind of, some, you're kind of on the same level. But, to but think, it's like, you know, they're just the quality of the judges, that's yeah. the other thing. Yes. Because I think, you know, if you do a lot of, advocacy mm. some some judges are better than others of course they are and and there's nothing more frustrating than a judge who's not quite getting your argument yes and some judges when they don't quite get your argument it makes them angry and frustrated yeah and then they start to get aggressive and those kinds of hearings can be deeply frustrating for everybody for the barrister for the court for the client and in the Supreme Court, the judges are so good that that doesn't happen. Yeah. They, they might not agree with your argument. Yes. They might very politely tell you that you're going to lose. And that, of course, is part of the game. But yeah. you never feel like they haven't understood the point you're trying to make. Right. And that makes it very satisfying. Absolutely. Now, I want to move on because there's so much I want to get through. How did you come to be where you are now? Your other bar, highly successful barrister. Then you took silk. Mm. Then you, I want to say you were deputy high court judge or your master. Yes. I, can't no, I thought high you were deputy court. Yeah. high court judge. And then suddenly you're here at Maudlin College. What's the attraction? I mean, it's a beautiful oh, sunny right. day. You're sitting here in my study. I know. It's, it's wonderful. I want to just go punting on the river and drink pims, quite frankly. But, you know, as I'm here and feeling, you know, all academic, actually, I can't see the attraction. Um, I, but I just want you to just talk me through why you made that move. So I'd been at the bar for nearly 30 years, and our younger daughter went to university in 2019. Mm. And with my husband, Peter, we decided that we should take a break because I've been working really hard for a very yeah, long time. Absolutely. And you know what it's like at the bar. It's yeah. very intense. Yeah. And, you know, you you never really switch off. No. No, ever. No. You're, there's always something worrying you. Yeah. There's always a case coming up and you're thinking, is everything okay? Is there more I need to be doing? And then, you know, the papers come in and the papers get bigger and bigger and bigger and the cases get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the responsibility is ultimately on your shoulders. Yes. And in recent years, I was leading big cases where there might be two or three silks, two or three juniors, mm. sometimes two city law firms, Yeah, you know, and so you've got a massive team of people. Absolutely. And it's a huge amount of responsibility all the time. And, and so I thought, let's take a break. Mm. And we went, we had a wonderful, wonderful holiday in New Zealand. Uh, mm. In retrospect, we timed it perfectly. This was just the beginning of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a fantastic time in New Zealand. And then um, we have a house in the Lake District, which we've had for a long time. And I always wanted to spend the spring and summer in the Lake District. Yeah. So we did that. And the idea was that I would then go back to London, go back to work. Yeah. And I realised by June, I didn't really want to go back to London. I was just loving being in the Lake District. Yeah. And we put our house in London on the market. Who does that? <laughs> no, I just felt it was kind of, I suppose it was a sort of midlife crisis, you know. Um, yeah, maybe. And just at that moment, yeah. I got a call from a headhunter about this job in, wow. in Maudlin. So the timing was perfect. It happened just at the moment when I'd already really taken the decision that I wanted a change of direction. I wanted to do something different. Mm. And I decided I didn't want to go on the bench. But while, while we were in New Zealand... Because I was coming to that question. Yeah, well, so, so I, was, I was asked, I had, I had a, um, an email from the Lord Chief Justice asking if I would extend my tenure as a deputy because yeah. it was a four-year term. And I thought about it while we were in New Zealand and wrote back and said, no, thank you. And I realised I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a judge. Really? So, you know, at that point, I didn't really have any other ideas. So this offer 
sort of, I mean, it was, you know, after the headhunter had to go yeah. through a grueling, I was going grueling to say. selection procedure culminating in a 12 hour long selection day. That oh went my from gosh. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Of course, the most important part was dinner. <laughs> that's always the most important absolutely part. when they tell you it's all over it sort of just came at the right moment wow yeah and i mean you're loving it here and uh you know you're making great impact but just because you decided not to be a, a judge i wonder if i can ask you this question you know lord reed said i think it was two years ago now there must be more diversity in um in the Supreme Court, and he would like to see diversity before he retires. I think it's four years now left before he retires, maybe five. Uh, and of course, when he said it, they had three women yeah. in the Supreme Court. Yeah. They now have gone backwards, yeah. and they now only have Lady Rose yeah. still. And still no people of colour. Still no people of colour. So why didn't you decide, you know, not, not to stay? Because you could, in theory, be in the Supreme Court. I mean, you still can. Well, there, there are lots of reasons. I, I enjoyed sitting as a judge. Yes. I very much enjoyed deciding cases. What I didn't like was the feeling of being a kind of cog in the Ministry of Justice's machine. Yes. Uh, I don't think I thrive well in those kinds of institutional environments. It's interesting. We, we spend a lot of time in this country criticizing the way that America appoints its judiciary, yes, particularly the Supreme Court. Yes. And you and I were discussing before we started recording. Yes, we um, Brett Kavanaugh, yeah. you know, the, the circus of the confirmation hearing, particularly in his case. Yes. And the very polarized politicization of the Supreme Court in the States. Yeah. And we tend to look at that rather smugly. Yes, we do, because we think we're better. Yeah. But I think our system has almost the equal and opposite flaws, which is its lack of transparency, mm. the secrecy of the process. Yes. And I think, you know, I don't want to criticise any individual judge. No, but no. I've, see, I've heard a lot of very senior members of the judiciary talk about the importance of diversity. And I have then seen a striking lack <laughs> of any uh, great progress, certainly at the level of the Supreme Court. I, yes. I think it has to be said that the diversity of the High Court and the Court of Appeal has increased significantly. Yes. Um, but when you look at things like the Supreme Court appointment process, it's still very opaque. And I don't know if you read the diaries of Lord Hope. Yes. And if you look at those together with the memoirs of Lord Dyson, it's very clear that there was a kind of... Uh, little ganging up to stop Lady Hale being president. Yeah. And that that was done because she was a feminist. Yes. And that wasn't very long ago. No. So, you know, I think our system still has quite a long way to go. Yeah. Yes. Well, I wonder if I can ask you about, I suppose, advice for young people. You know, COVID has been a disaster for everybody in many different ways. But for young people wanting to enter the profession, because there are less places, depending on what areas they want to go to. And I wonder if you had maybe quick tips for anybody wanting to enter law now. Um, and, and then, actually, I, I'll move on to ask you about the retention, because the attrition rates for women and underrepresented groups are, are still quite poor. Yes, I mean, obviously... My own experiences are, are massively out of date now. Yes. Um, but I see the experiences of my students. Yeah. And I think there's no doubt that the bar still has a great appeal. Mm -hmm. And I understand why. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the great tragedies of the last few years is how the criminal bar is now no longer really seen as a viable career by young people. And you can understand why. Uh, totally. I, you'd have to be, you either have to have a trust fund behind you. Yes. Or and be, who has that? Exactly. Or, or be quite mad to decide to do it. Because the idea that you're actually going to be able to make a living at a criminal bar is, you know, far fetched mm. at the moment. And, and the uh, quality of life is, is abysmal. But other areas of the bar are still very appealing. And 
Yeah. I mean, none, none of this is rocket science, but I mean, a lot of my students are involved heavily in, in mooting. Yes. And I think that's still really important. First, because it's probably the best way to discover if the bar is right for you. If you hate mooting, you're not going to be a barrister. Yeah. But if you discover that you enjoy it and you've got an aptitude for it, it's a pretty good indication that you would be a good barrister. And I think now postgraduate degrees are much more expected of those who want to go to the bar. Yeah, they are. Uh, in, in my day, lots of people, I mean, I, I, I didn't even have a law degree. I did a history degree. Oh, then so I, did, can... I did a one year postgraduate diploma. That was the only law I ever studied apart from bar school. <laughs> Um, but nowadays, people, you know, they, they will routinely do the BCL or a master's, yeah. you might go to Harvard or Cambridge, you know, people are expected by a lot of chambers to have some kind of postgraduate qualification, which of course means that the amount of money you have to invest is even more. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely a factor. Um, and the other one, which is, again, not rocket science, is getting as much varied experience as you can. Um, mini pupillages, summer internships, just going along to your local court and watching some hearings. Yeah. There's no substitute for that. No, no, not at all. And, and what about women? I mean, firstly, we're in a profession where you kind of wait for somebody to say, oh, have you thought about silk? Oh, have you thought about sitting? Oh, have you? It is not a job where you get an appraisal of any sort. No. Um, so where did your kind of courage come from, if I can put it that way, to apply for silk or take the opportunity? Did you have mentors or sponsors? And yes. what advice would you have for perhaps women where they are leaving? Yeah, um, I mean, so, so two different things there. One, one yeah. about progression, another about women leaving. Women leaving, yeah. And I think so far as women leaving is concerned, a lot of that is about... The, the difficult stage that a lot of women go through, often not with their first child, but with their second child. Yes. And I think there are lots of women who will continue at the bar after they've had one baby, and then they have a second, and everything really gets much tougher. Now, from my perspective, yeah. I've told you already that oh, of course. I wanted to go back. And, yeah. and, and I was always the main breadwinner. Yeah. So the reality is I didn't have a great deal of choice. Mm. Um, and in a way that makes it a lot easier yeah. because I think we all need, not all, but most of us need two spurs to ambition. One is that what I think was the positive impetus. I really want to do this. I really want to be the best. Yes. And the other is the negative impetus, which okay. is if I don't do this, I won't be able to pay the mortgage. Yeah, quite. But without the financial necessity, I think the temptation to stop is very great because particularly life as a senior junior, and a lot of women will be at, at that life stage when they have their second child. They'll be somewhere in their mid to late thirties. Yes. And, you know, life as a senior junior is exhausting and intense and stressful. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a partner who's earning good money and is saying, you don't need to work or you don't need to work full time, or you don't need to work so hard. That's an incredibly tempting thought. And, if you really don't need to do it financially, I can see why a lot of women throw in the towel and think, you know, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. It's just too painful. Yeah. Because the bar is often agony. You're often at the same time. Oh, yeah. Colossally stressed and colossally bored. Yes, it's true. <laughs> and those two emotions are not good ones. And particularly when you have both of them simultaneously. Of course, there are other times when it's utterly exhilarating. Yeah. When you feel on top of the world. And a lot of people will do it for those highs. Yeah. But um, that balance can be quite delicate when you have young children. It can, it can. And I suspect the criminal bar, those highs are probably some of the things that have kept yeah. so, so many yeah. of us at, at it. You raise an important point there about well-being, which I was going to ask you about a bit later on, but let's deal with it now. Um, well-being of the bar, let's face it, you know, we're not great at it. No. You know, the burnout rate is pants. We've all had weeks. I mean, I was thinking about, oh, gosh, you know, those cases where you just drink coffee. You can spend all day in court, get home, have coffee, say goodnight to children, and then up the next day, out. Yeah. You know, grass doesn't get cut. All, yeah. all those other things in, in 
our lives. And I just wondered what you do for well-being, what you did do at the bar for well-being, and what do you do now? So I, I suffered a bad episode of stress uh, in around 2004 when I was involved in a long trial in Croydon, which is not convenient, let's be honest. And our nanny went down with appendicitis. Oh gosh. And my parents were away on holiday and we were moving house. And all of these events happened simultaneously. (laughs) We had two children. And moving house itself is the most stressful thing apparently. But 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 everything else on top. On top. Um, So, that was, that was the most stressed I've ever been. Mm. And I became so acutely stressed that I actually had to take time off sick. Oh, gosh. And it was a real eye-opener for me. Mm. In, in some ways, I found it utterly humiliating. Yeah. Because your first reaction as a barrister is, I can't take it. Yes. And that's my weakness. Yeah. And I think we are so strongly conditioned to blame ourselves for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So I found that very difficult, personally. But in the end, it was enormously beneficial to me. And looking back on it, I, in some ways, it's a turning point of my career where I became a much more mature advocate yeah. because I learned to detach myself much more from my cases. Yeah. And I think you have to put up a barrier of mm-hmm. objectivity between you and your cases. You can't um, embrace every aspect of the case, you have to give yourself space. The other thing was to make sure that when I took on big and stressful cases, I had proper resources to make sure that there would be enough barristers instructed to take on the workload so that I wouldn't have to shoulder too heavy a burden. And I think sometimes we don't do that. And the client may not be able to afford it, but then the answer is, I'm not gonna do the case Um, because, I, I don't want to jeopardize my mental and physical health Absolutely. from taking on a burden of work that I can't accommodate. So that was very important. Yeah. There were some rules that I always applied. Uh, I almost never worked late at night. Really? I would get up early in the morning. So if I was in court, I would regularly get up at 4 a.m. Wow. Um, but I would always knock off at 6. Yeah, such a good so idea. I would always see my children at dinner time and bath time and have a relaxing evening. I would not go back to work after the children were in bed. Really? No, I would normally be in bed quite early because I would, you know, often get up very early. Yeah. And that worked for me because mentally I tend to be sharpest early in the morning. Mm. Um, and I think that helped a lot. And the other thing is making sure that you get proper holidays and enough exercise. I mean, you know, none yeah. of this is rocket science. No, but we just don't do it. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that I think really improved my mental health. Do you remember a few years ago when they were doing renovation work at the temple? Yeah. And they closed Temple Tube. Yeah, they did and for ages. For ages. I think it was about a year and a half or something. And um, so because they closed the temple, I started walking from embankment through, oh, right. through the gardens, yeah. which are lovely, beautiful gardens. And when the temple came back on stream, I continued to walk from embankment because... I found that 10 or 15 minutes yeah. so good for me. Mm. It was really enjoyable and calming. And I loved just watching the way the garden would change over the course of the year. Yes. You know, the tulips would come and then the summer bedding would come. It was just great. Wow. So it's just little things little like things. that yeah. can make a lot of difference. Wow. I think I might try the early the early start as well, uh, but I, I might struggle. But not everybody is a lot. No, no, they're, they're not. Um, I want to ask you a very serious question about your faith. You're Jewish. What impact has your faith played in your professional career? I, I think the first thing to say is, I think Judaism or being Jewish is not just about faith. No. It's, an, it's an ethnic identity and a cultural identity yes. as well. Yeah. And there are lots of atheist Jews who identify as Jews. Uh, actually, I'm not an atheist. I am a practicing Jew. Yeah. Um, but lots of people who are Jewish aren't. So it's, not, it's much more complicated than just being about faith. Yeah. It's more about identification. I think that Jews are a small group, mm. although probably 
more Jewish lawyers than in many other professions. Yes, there are. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes that can mean that they're a little bit isolated or invisible. And I, d- I couldn't say it have ever affected my profession or my career, but sometimes, sometimes you hear the odd comment that makes your eyebrow raise. Yes, yes. But what do you think about diversity in the profession? Do you think we're getting better? I mean, either on the bar or even on the bench, because I'm looking to the future and I'm here in yeah. this wonderful college and thinking about your students, you know, what's your intake like? And can you confidently say, come to the bar? It's so much more diverse now. The bar is so much more diverse than when I went. Mm. I mean, when I went to the bar, uh, women were small minority and the number of women QCs was very, very small. Yes. And um, one of the reasons I chose my chambers, which is chambers that's now Blackstone, yeah. at that time it was called Two Hair Court. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, one, one of the reasons I chose that chambers to be pupillage was that there was a woman QC there. And for there to be a woman QC in a commercial set of chambers at that date was unusual. Yes. That was Barbara Doman, one of the pione- pioneering wow. uh, women commercial silks. So we have definitely made great strides. I mean, I, I remember when I was a bar student attending a mooting competition at Middle Temple where a friend of mine was mooting. And there was a drinks reception afterwards. And one of the benches said to me that he thought the reason women uh, didn't tend to succeed at the bar was because uh, judges found their voices irritating because they were too shrill. I feel like doing is shrill now. It's amazing, it's, isn't it? You, have so you do you, you do get that that you know that was a not uncommon view of women advocates at that date. And I think that um, ethnic minority barristers were a really tiny minority and tended to be confined to certain sets of chambers doing certain kinds of work, particularly immigration and crime. Yes, and, and there were classes ghetto chambers. Yeah, which is um, appalling when you think Really about appalling. It. It's shocking, it's shocking. And, and everyone just kind of, you know, shrugged, that was the way it was. So I think things have improved, and I think more for certain groups than for other groups. Mm. I think that um, for South and East Asian barristers, there are now significant numbers. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I yeah. think for black barristers, there's still more, more issues. Yeah. And they're different now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me, one of the ways you use your voice is on Twitter. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, sometimes it's just posting pictures of flowers, like I am. Or and, the and, and the dog. Yeah, the dog <laughs> and the cat. <laughs> yes. I must say, I love the, the Christmas time when there was a fish crop of the cat. Was it Christmas? It was when it snowed. Yes. And it just looked so beautiful. Because you've got thousands of followers. I think you're up to it. You had 10,000 now. I can't more, remember. More. More. Uh, we've... But most of them are probably bots. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but are you comfortable using these platforms? Because I think it's important that yeah. we all use them. Uh, yes, I'm going to regret saying this probably. But, but yes, I mean, I, I, I am very careful with what I say on Twitter. Yeah, yes. Um, I think you'd struggle to find me getting involved in any kind of argument on Twitter. Yeah. I don't tweet about party politics mm. and I have never tweeted about cases I'm involved in. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think those are two golden rules. Absolutely. A lot of what I tweet is about the college or about life here. Yeah. If I do tweet on any small P political question, it will normally be about access to justice yeah. or the rule of law. Because I feel that is a non-party political question on which I do actually have something to say. Yeah. And it is the issue about which I feel most strongly, which is one of the reasons that the Unison case is my favourite case. Um, because, yeah, I think I think access to justice is the, the fundamental right that underlies all the others. Yes. Because if you can't enforce any right, it doesn't matter what rights you have in a constitution or in the European Convention or a common law. No. If you can't enforce them, they're meaningless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think the rule of law is still so important now. I mean, I agree with you about access to justice, and, you know, and I'm a trustee of the Access to Justice Foundation. But do you think we're still, as a country, very keen to enforce and reassure people that the rule of law is important and exists, and we as lawyers and academics are part of that process, and, and, and we're important in enforcing it? 
I think the rule of law has been really badly eroded. I think that when you have a government that talks about lefty right on lawyers, uh, I mean, today, uh, the prime minister has been quoted as saying that lawyers who were making submissions to seek an injunction to stop the flight to Rwanda yes. were abetting criminal gangs. You know, that, that kind of comment being made by the prime minister mm. is appalling yeah. in its implications. And it has become commonplace. We've had the home secretary yes. making similar comments. I, I think it's devastating. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, it's, it, again, this is not a party political question. Oh, no, David, David yeah. Blunkett is probably the person who started that trend. Um, but, you know, it probably reached an early high with the infamous Enemies of the People headline yes. in the Daily Mail. And, and things have only got, you know, things have never got better from, from, from that point. Mm. In which case, then, the independence of judges then is crucial. Absolutely um, critical. Um, yeah. To that. Well, we're coming towards the end now, but I want to ask you about books, because I love books as a book club and women in the law. I want to ask you if you've got a favourite book and if you can share it with us and why. But also, um, if you've got a favourite legal character. I'm assuming the book doesn't have to be a legal theme. Absolutely book. not. My favourite book is probably Jane Eyre. Yeah. Uh, I first read it when I must have been about 12 or 13. And the feminist message that you've got to make your own living is so fantastic. Yeah. The, the idea that she cannot be content to be kept by a man. She has to be financially independent. That, that's what the whole theme of the book is. Yes. And yeah. uh, I love that. And I still love it. It's a wonderful book. Um, legal character. I must say, I was very taken with Maxine Peake in Silk. Yes, I know she'll be listening to this. She'll be delighted. <laughs> I thought her performance, the sort of late night frazzled barrister alone <laughs> raiding the fridge, you know, that, that's, I think that resonates with women at the bar. <laughs> Even though I have to say that the court scenes in Silk were never quite as realistic as the chamber scenes. No, interesting, actually, because I know she did spend time with Helena uh, Kennedy at some point. It was really the dialogue. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, the number of case, the number of times that, you know, suddenly the brilliant point comes out. You know, but, you know. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this, actually, as you raised it. Maxine, she's been on this podcast. Oh, has she? Right? Yes. And so she says that um, in her prep for that role, she found and thought that barristers were actually just like actors. Yeah. Um, would you agree with that? Uh, totally, yes. I mean, when, when I was at university, the main thing I did was acting. Right. And I loved acting. And I did seriously consider going on the stage before I realised this would be madness, uh, because I would never make a living. Yes. But I think the bar is very similar. Actually, particularly the criminal bar. Yeah, yeah. I think the camaraderie that you find at the criminal bar, uh, which you don't find in the same way in, at the civil bar. I think it's wonder. I love, I love criminal barristers. I love, I love the kind of, the kind <laughs> of gusto, the war stories, the heavy drinking. The, you know, it, it's it's wonderful. They are they are still, they're the buccaneers of the bar. Yes, yeah. All the albeit poor, very poor. Poor, all, but yeah. yeah. But they're where all the fun is. Yes. There's absolutely. a part of me that feels that I'm not a real barrister because I've never addressed the jury. What? I think that's that's the real that's that's the true art. What what? Despite changing laws, I mean, how many barristers can say? No, but you know. <laughs> well, you know, when we're all trying to lobby the government yeah. to increase pay and fund the system, less so about our pay and its needs. A few it, years ago, it'll I was be involved, interesting. I was involved in this really fun charity event. It's a charity called the Shakespeare in Schools Foundation. I've heard of it. They're, they're wonderful. They, they basically um, encourage school children to perform Shakespeare on professional stages. And they had a charity fundraiser where they hired a West End theatre and they put Macbeth on trial. And they had um, Mr Justice Burton was the judge and Jeremy Paxman was the foreman of the jury. <laughs> and they had four QCs um, representing the prosecution of the defence. And I, and I co-defended Macbeth. And Christopher Eccleston 
was the defendant. And we had so much fun. And, and we had Lady Macbeth as a surprise witness. Did you? Hayden Gwynn was Lady Macbeth. And the great fun part of it was, of course, it, it wasn't actually a trial. It was actually drama. Yeah. And so we could basically make whatever we wanted happen. So we cooked up this little scheme where she was going to break in the witness box and sort of the whole horror of the blood would suddenly overtake her. And it was, it was just enormously good fun. And what was great about it was the feeling of collaboration, yeah. that everyone there is a team yes. doing it for the entertainment of the audience. Yes. And at the end, I think, if you want to know the single reason why I moved on from the bar, yeah. I think that is it. That uh, after 30 years, that slightly corrosive at the bar, that it's always adversarial slightly gets to you. There's something slightly destructive about the bar. And the thing about the job I'm doing now mm. is it's all about team working and collaboration and working to make this already great institution even better. Yeah. And that's enormously satisfying. Wow. I don't want people to go and um, sort of leave the bar now because I think I'm gonna, <laughs> you're going to make everybody want to do something else. But that's really powerful. Well, Dana, finally, as somebody who's appeared in so many great cases and, and so many um, great courts, if you like, um, I want to ask you about advocacy. I teach advocacy. I've done this for oh, God knows how long now to young people at the bar. And um, can you give us perhaps three tips about a good advocate? I mean, what should people be thinking about respect of advocacy? The first thing, and this is, I'm afraid, not what people want to hear, and it's very dull, is preparation, preparation, preparation. There is no substitute for that. And it is, at the end of the day, what makes the difference. Yeah. The barrister who knows every single fact, who has read every single case, and who is right in there instantly with the flaw in their opponent's argument is more likely to win. So that's the first thing. There's no shortcut to that. And you do have to work enormously hard to be a really, really good barrister. Yeah. The second thing is, I think, advocacy, good advocacy is about storytelling. But it's one thing to think, well, I have these three points. The question you've got to ask yourself, especially if you're an appellate advocate, yeah is how can I mold those points into a narrative? And into a narrative that takes the judge down the route that I would like them to, to go. And that's partly about working out how you're gonna order your points. Mm. Do you wanna start with the facts or do you wanna start with the legal principles? Or maybe an overview of the facts and then more on the law. How, how is it most attractively presented? Which one of your legal submissions do you want to take first? That's always one of the most difficult questions. Yes. There might be something that logically comes first, like mm. a jurisdictional point. Yes. But it might not be your strongest point. And if it's not your strongest point, do you want to take it first? Mm. Or do you want to go straight in with your strongest point? If you do that, you're going to telegraph to the court that you did on your jurisdictional point. Yeah. And these kinds of questions, those questions of judgment, I think, are what make the difference. The third point is keep it simple. And the great exemplar of this is David Panic. Yes. Uh, the, the amazing talent of J David Panic. I mean, you know, there's so much you can say about his advocacy. Yeah. But the, the absolutely amazing thing about him is you will see him in any case, the most complicated case, and he'll get up and say, my Lord, I have three points. <laughs> I'll come out with three points. And I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a joke in Chambers that that is what he will do. And that's just brilliant. And sometimes I see my opponents and they're going, my Lord, eighthly. And I'm going, no, <laughs> never eighthly. It's never eighthly. Because if you say that to a judge, that they, they're immediately suicidal. Yes. You know, how many more of these points are there? I can't take it. So, you know, <laughs> think about that. I love that. I absolutely that I have three points, not eight. Yeah. Um, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Well, Diana, it's been so wonderful. I want to carry on. I want to have an excuse to come back 
here. And I'm hoping actually that uh, you'll appear in the Grey's Inn miscellinate, which seems to uh, uh, go on in the inn, because you and I are both uh, members of Grey's Inn, um, and hear more um, acting. But you know, on an average day, what would your day entail here? at the college. What, one of the joys of this job is there are no average days. Oh, right. I, it's incredibly varied. So I could be doing anything from presiding over a committee to having tea with an extraordinary range of very interesting people, um, to taking delivery of a pair of samurai swords that have been bequeathed to the college, wow. to drafting new disciplinary processes for the university to um, traveling to America to see alumni, yeah. um, enormous variety of different activities. Seeing students, you know, it's, it's an amazing and varied job. It's fascinating. Really and, and the college is so complicated. It, it has so many different facets. And, and there are so many different constituencies here. Yes. Like the students, the fellows, the staff, the alumni, yeah. who all have different needs and as the president you're the one person who is really responsible for trying to ensure that all of those very different needs are being met well what a fascinating fascinating job um thank you so much for your time and well, thank, thank you, you for sharing your career with us on talking law it's been a pleasure sam Big thank you to Dinah Rose QC for talking law in this interview with me, Sally Penny, on BE. If you'd like to support Talking Law, then please get in touch. You can find me on Twitter at Sally Penny One or search for Sally Penny on LinkedIn or Instagram. You can also search for Women in the Law UK. Do make sure you catch up with previous episodes of Talking Law where you can hear my interviews with guests such as the first female president of the Supreme Court, Lady Hale, and also Judge John Deeds, the actor, Martin Shaw. Before I go, quick reminder about the annual dinner. And also, don't forget to watch my TED Talk at TED.com. Thanks to our production team, Sam Walker and Michael Blades of What Gives On Media. I'm Sally Penny, MBE. Bye for now.